This is the message, the Rizvon message of our beloved Universal House of Justice to the entire Baha'i world. Dearly loved friends, the observable acceleration during the past decade of the two processes described by our beloved guardian, the disintegration of the old order and the progress and consolidation of the new world order of Baha'u'llah may well come to be regarded by future historians as one of the most remarkable features of this period. The recent increase in this very acceleration is even more remarkable, both within and without the cause of God Powerful forces are operating to bring to a climax the twin tendencies of this portentous century. Among the many evidences which reveal this process may be cited on the one hand the continual increase of lawlessness, terrorism, economic confusion, immorality, and the growing danger from the proliferation of weapons of destruction. And on the other hand, the worldwide divinely propelled expansion, consolidation, and rapid emergence into the limelight of world affairs of the cause itself. A process crowned by the wonderful efflorescence of Mount Carmel, the mountain of God, whose divine springtime is now so magnificently burgeoning. During the past five years, the historical dialectic of triumph and disaster has operated simultaneously within the cause of God. The army of light has sustained the loss of six hands of the cause and waves of bitter persecution which have again engulfed the long-suffering community in Iran and have resulted in the raising of the house of the Baal, the demolition of Baha'u'llah's ancestral home in Takur, and the martyrdom of scores of valiant souls. Yet these disasters have called forth fresh energies in the hearts of the friends have fed the deep roots of the cause and given rise to a great harvest of signal victories. Chief among these are the successful conclusion of the five-year plan, the launching of the seven-year plan now in the final year of its second phase, an unprecedented proclamation of the faith to heads of state, parliaments, and parliamentarians, government ministers and officials, leaders of thought and people prominent in the professions, resulting in a change of attitude on the part of the mass media, which now increasingly approach us for information about the faith. To these movements must be added the worldwide observances commemorating the 50th anniversary of the passing of the greatest holy leaf, the completion of the restoration of the upper floor of the house of Abdullah Pasha and its opening at this very time to its first visitors, the occupation by the universal house of justice of its permanent seat in further fulfillment of the great prophecy in the Tablet of Carmel. Steady progress on the construction of the first Mashak Alaskar of the Pacific Islands in Samoa and the mother temple of the Indian subcontinent in New Delhi. Among the outstanding features of the teaching and consolidation work are the continuing effective results of the partition, participation of more than 16,000 believers from all parts of the world. 16,000 believers from all parts of the world in the five intercontinental conferences. Intense intensive teaching campaigns carried out with the active support of all levels of the community 
and drawing upon the enthusiasm and capacity of Baha'i youth. The establishment of a second radio station in South America, the reformation of the National Spiritual Assemblies of Uganda and Nepal, and the establishment of nine new National Spiritual Assemblies, two of which will be elected during the month of May this year, bringing the total of these secondary houses of justice to 135. Above and beyond all these is the unity in action achieved by the Baha'i world community in its efforts to enlist public support for the dearly loved, greatly admired, cruelly beleaguered Iranian believers, a unity further manifest in its outpourings of funds to replace their former liberal contributions, and an upsurge of personal dedication rarely seen on so universal a scale and holding the highest promise for the future. The growing maturity of a worldwide religious community, which all these processes indicate, is further evidenced in the reaching out by a number of national communities to the social and economic life of their countries exemplified by the founding of tutorial schools, the inception of radio stations, the pursuit of rural development programs, and the operation of medical and agricultural schemes. To these early beginnings must be added the undoubted skills acquired as a result of the Iranian crisis in dealing with international organizations, national governments, and the mass media. The very elements of society which it must increasingly collaborate with towards the realization of peace on earth. A wider horizon is opening before us, illumined by a growing and universal manifestation of the inherent potentialities of the cause for ordering human affairs. In this light can be discerned not only our immediate tasks, but more dimly new pursuits and undertakings upon what which we must shortly become engaged. At present, we must complete the objectives of the seven-year plan, paying great attention to those inner spiritual developments which will be manifested in greater unity among the friends and in national and local spiritual assemblies functioning harmoniously, vigorously, and efficiently as the guardian desired. We have no doubt that the Baha'i world community will accomplish all these tasks and go forward to new achievements. The powers released by Baha'u'llah match the needs of the times. The powers released by Baha'u'llah match the needs of the times. We may therefore be utterly confident that the new throb of energy now vibrating throughout the cause will empower it to meet the oncoming challenges of assisting as maturity and resources allow the development of the social and economic life of peoples, of collaborating with the forces leading towards the establishment of order in the world, of influencing the exploitation and constructive uses of modern technology, and in all these ways enhancing the prestige and progress of the faith and uplifting the conditions of the generality of mankind. It is a time for rejoicing. The son of Baha'u'llah is mounting the heavens, bringing into ever clearer light the contrast between the gloom, the despair, the frustrations and bewilderment of the world, and the radiance, confidence, 
joy and certitude of his lovers. Lift up your hearts. The day of God is here. With loving Baha'i greetings, the Universal House of Justice. Universal House of Justice, as you will note from your program, or rather from the letter sent out to all the National Assembly some time ago, has desired during these very important sessions of our Fifth International Convention to take up certain themes in connection with our work. We must realize that this is not a national convention. This is a truly stupendous and unique opportunity from delegates from all over the world, not only to enjoy this marvelous occasion and visit the holy places and have an opportunity to see so many wonderful people from different races and cultures and backgrounds drawn from the entire Baha'i world, but it is an opportunity to exchange views to consult with each other and find out how the other National Assembly is doing it, what problems they have, what you can learn from them, what they can learn from you, what you can share with each other. And the House of Justice, therefore, has set aside, as you know, special opportunities, which I think are a unique and marvelous opportunity for the delegates to be together and to do this, and it has chosen for every single session in this auditorium a theme. In other words, it's not just hodgepodge, where we get up and each of us says what we think we would like to say, which may have no bearing on any particular subject. I see that many Baha'is are familiar with Baha'i occasions in this auditorium. (laughs) But we're asked to consider certain points. Now, the theme for this morning, for the opening session of the convention, after the wonderful, wonderful experience of the election yesterday, which I'm sure will be indelibly impressed on all of our souls throughout eternity, the beauty of that place, to be in the House of Justice, to see all these delegates come up from so many nations, some of them in their national costumes, and cast their ballot, the feeling of love and of unity was really a priceless, priceless experience. But because of the persecutions in Persia, the sufferings of our fellow Baha'is, which alas seem to be increasing rather than decreasing, it has opened all over the world doors before our faces, which have never been opened before. There may be Baha'is in this hall older than I, but I've been a Baha'i now for almost 73 years, and even as a child I used to go to Baha'i conventions and gatherings. And I am a witness that never in our whole lives, never could we dream that this miracle would take place for us to see the beginning of the emancipation of the faith and certainly the proclamation of the faith. And I hope that this understanding can go into our minds of what has happened in the world today. The parliaments, the leaders, in some cases the nation itself, are showing kindness to the Baha'is and interest in the Baha'i faith. And this is really a golden opportunity, as the House of Justice wants to emphasize this morning. We, you National Assembly members, your auxiliaries, and all of the Baha'is, must make an effort to bring the faith before the people of the world as never before. And particularly in an ordered and thoughtful and properly controlled manner, as Shoghi Fendi himself pointed out, 
you bring a knowledge of the aims, purposes, history of the faith to high officials, to governments, to parliamentarians, to leaders of whatever nature they may be, ecclesiastical or lay in different fields, and above all to the media. We may never, never have another opportunity like this. We have to realize it. So often we are such little people. I speak for myself. Maybe you think you're a very big person, but I'm quite sure I'm a very little person. And I've often marveled at how God could expect something so small to really do anything worthwhile. But it's the power of God that does it, not our own power. We have to realize that. You can hear my voice because this thing is plugged in to the electricity in this building. And there are instruments that enable you to hear what I'm saying. It's not I. You couldn't just hear me twittering up here all by myself. But you can hear me clearly because of the instruments involved. And we have to realize that it is Baha'u'llah that uses us as the instruments. He helps us. He inspires us. And I think that national bodies have to understand this, that the power of God will be with them if they carry out these instructions of their universal house of justice for this period right in front of us. And that individuals have to realize that the power of Baha'u'llah is there to help them. My mother was told by Abdul Baha, she was a little tiny slip of a person who had been very ear, ill before she became a Baha'i and who had not had much of an education. He said, you must speak on the faith. And she said, I, Abdul Baha, I, I can't. He said, no, you must talk. You must give talks. You must speak on the faith. He said, pray, turn your thoughts to me, and I will inspire you. And my mother became a truly brilliant Baha'i speaker. Why? Because she listened to Abdul Baha. I have found in my own experience all over the world that I always do this when I'm supposed to give a talk. I didn't have time this morning, but then I had that beautiful message to read. <laughs> Generally speaking, I always do it. I turn my thoughts to, to God and to the Master and pray and say, please inspire me what to say, and please help me not to say the wrong thing. Because often we say the wrong thing instead of the right thing, whereas if we try really hard, thoughtfully, prayerfully, to say the right thing, we will get the, po the power and the help from God to do it. And I think that this is what we have to realize. All of you, as NSAs, as individuals, all the Baha'is behind you in your own countries, this is not some secret thing. This isn't something you're elected to or voted into. This is the promises in the faith of God, that if you, with all your heart, whatever the occasion may be, are seeking to serve and promulgate the cause of God, you will be able to do it because he will help you. Not because you are capable. God forbid none of us are capable. But he is, and he will help you. And as you try it, you will see how it works. This is the most wonderful thing. The reed becomes a whole forest. The ant becomes a whole battalion of soldiers in this cause. Why? Because it turns to the source of power with confidence and humility and asks for help. Baha'u'llah says, if you ask, I will never fail you. That's approximately exactly what he means in so many tablets. Now we have to do it. And we have to do it in connection with these specific things the House of Justice has told us to do. The national bodies or the generals, they have to think about these things and plan it. But the believers also have to fulfill within their own field to the best of their ability within the administrative order, not outside of it off their own uh, head, you know, I'm going to do it this way because I've been told I can do it. No, within the framework of the administration, 
With the proper guidance and the proper confidence, now we have to go ahead and see that governments, government officials, any kind of an official, leaders, the media, begin to understand what this cause of Baha'u'llah is about, how gravely we are being persecuted, why we are being persecuted, because these are our universal aims and teachings and so on. And if we arise to do it, friends, we can do it. But we must not let the opportunity slip through our fingers. It's too precious, and it won't come again. I think Baha'u'llah in one of his writings says, opportunity comes but once. It's not going to hang around waiting until you feel you're better qualified or until you've had that baby or you've got a better job or you think that uh, your mother won't be too upset because you are giving more time to the Baha'i faith, you see. It's no time for excuses. There isn't that much time, perhaps, left in the world. But above all, I think what we all need to take away from here is the spirit that we have felt here. And what is that spirit, if you analyze it? You haven't been deluged in a flood of administrative spirit. When you were sitting yesterday in the House of Justice, you weren't sitting there thinking, oh, how beautifully this is organized. Look at the ushers, the way they parole up and down. Look at the way they give us a piece of paper when we want it. Look at the way they guide us if we ask a question. You weren't thinking of that. You were, you were thinking of how wonderful it all was and under the shadow of the House of Justice. But what you were experiencing was love and unity. That's what we all feel here, particularly at this convention more than any of the other conventions. A love and a unity that is a vibrant thing. Abdul Baha says that the whole theme of the Baha'i revelation is love. He says, for that matter, that it's the theme of the universe. But he says the whole theme of this religion is love. And if we can't show that love to our fellow men, above all, if we can't create it in our local communities, we might as well go and be something other than Baha'is because we will have failed. We have to love each other, not hit each other over the head with rule on page 83. Or because a committee or somebody has voted for something, now I can strangle my fellow Baha'i to pieces with it. That's not what the Baha'i religion is about. The administration is a vehicle. It's a vehicle to teach the Baha'i faith. And what is this ocean of water that is supposed to throw, flow through these channels? Love. The love of God for mankind. The love of man for his creator. The reflection of it, of love in society, of love inside of our communities. Stop criticizing, stop backbiting, stop denigrating other people. Because we all know there's a great deal of it in the communities, which is probably, if anything, one thing could be said to be holding back the Baha'i faith, it's this. And learn to show this love inside our communities towards each other and outside towards humanity because they are starving to death for love. And I'm talking about Baha'i love. I'm not talking about the kind of love that people keep yapping about outside of these walls. I'm talking about the love of Baha'u'llah. Because without this, who wants the Baha'i religion? I don't. I'm not interested in the Baha'i faith because of the administrative order. I'm not interested because of all these wonderful teachings. My mind tells me that these are true. But that's not why I am a Baha'i. I am a Baha'i because I believe that this force of love from Almighty God through Baha'u'llah, the Master, Shoghi Effendi, is pouring into the world and will create the unity which is the purpose of Baha'u'llah's revelation and will establish a new world order and all the rest of it. Divine civilization, divine culture, and so on. But it's not going to be done without love. And I think that the Baha'is have to remember this. And surely, love is something that is not so complicated. We don't have to read a lot of books to understand from our writings how to show love towards each other and towards the people of the world. Friends, the meeting is now thrown open to the floor.
so that the delegates can express their views.